okay. Let's uh, let's begin. And anyone else, we'll just have to catch up. So uh, everyone, thank you for coming to uh, the seventh session of our uh, our conference on joining the circle. Today we are very honored to have Professor Schick from Tubingen. Uh, Professor Schick has uh, published widely on Hegel and has edited uh, two great collections of collected essays on Hegel and is the author of two books, Hegel's Wissenschaft der Logik, Metaphysische Letztbegründung oder Theorie Logischer Formen and Sache und Notwendigkeit, Studien zum Verhältnis von empirischer und begrifflicher Allgemeinheit. Why have that? Uh, today, Professor Schick is presenting her paper entitled Hegel on the Concept of Philosophy, the Introduction to the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Science. Professor Schick, thank you very much. Please proceed. Ooh, yes. <laughs> thank you for the right thing uh, to push on. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, for the invitation, for the opportunity to take part in this um, really inspiring conference. Um, my thanks also go to Sebastian Stein hi, and uh, Josia Ressel um, that gave me the permission to use um, a contribution to their collection, The Enduring Relevance of Hegel's uh, System, um, as a basis uh, for uh, my talk today. And um, special thanks uh, to Dino Jakusic, who helped me through um, the pitfalls of um, the English language <laughs> um, writing this draft. Thanks to all of you. So I begin. Um, in the first paragraph of the introduction to the encyclopedia in the version of 1813, Hegel begins, starts to define philosophy by contrasting philosophical versus non-philosophical sciences, and with a likewise contrasting tie into religion, which will be taken into account later on in the second part of my talk. The first quote, you will find it on the handout. There are the longer uh, quotes from the introduction. Um, I want to analyze a little bit more in detail. Paragraph one. Quote, philosophy lacks the advantage which the other sciences enjoy of being able to presuppose its objects as given immediately by representation. And with regard to its beginning and advance, it cannot presuppose the method of cognition as one that is already accepted. This statement is quite a reason to wonder. It seems to characterize a science that cannot even come into being because it lacks two elements crucial for any science, an object that it investigates and a mode of investigation that it could use for doing so. Due to its radical striving for absence of presuppositions, philosophy seems to exclude itself from any linking up with experience and non-philosophical scientific knowledge. And in excluding both, it seems to exclude its own possibility. To put it in the words of our conference, the possibility to get into the circle of the philosophical system without already moving in it seems to be constitutive for the system itself, whereas the demand for the absence of presuppositions seems to exclude this very same requirement. The following talk takes this initial paradox as a reason to ask the question, how does Hegel determine the relationship between philosophical and non-philosophical science? In which way are both linked as distinct but cooperative members of one continuous project of scientific knowledge? And what remains of the radical discontinuity the introduction starts with? In my talk, I seek the answer to this question mainly, so not exclusively, in the further course of the introduction to the encyclopedia. I try to show that there are two divergent strands to, distingu to be distinguished in Hegel's 
motivation and determination of philosophy. On the one hand, philosophical or speculative reflection fulfills a desideratum that arises on the soil and according to the immanent standards of non-philosophical empirical science. The relationship between non-philosophical and philosophical science seen in this first way is one of critical constructive continuation of, um, we might say, qualitative progress of the science. This side will be elaborated in the first part of my talk mainly following paragraph nine of the encyclopedia with a brief excursion into the science of logic, namely to the transition from causality to the concept. The second part of my talk will deal with a second, with, with what I think is a really second determination of the need for philosophy, which in addition to the need for knowledge of the world, introduces a need for a kind of pure self-affirmation of thinking, for satisfaction of thought in itself, which seems to start with a complete retreat, the separation from the concern with the contents of experience and the empirical sciences. On this basis, philosophy is then given the task of mediating this need for pure self-satisfaction of thinking separate from objectivity with the need for knowledge of objectivity. The execution of this mediation is then given over by Hegel to the large scale proof to be realized through the whole system that the mind not only learns to know the world but also constit constitutes its essence or in, Hegel, in Hegel's terms, its concept. References to the second strand are pursued in this contribution in paragraphs, according to paragraphs 1, 8, 11, and 12 of the encyclopedia. The final thesis of my presentation, which I shall um, present in the very short third part, is that these two strands of motiv motivating and defining the task of philosophy do not cohere with each other. Now, I come to my first part. Merits and deficiencies of non-philosophical science. The first motivation of philosophical reflection. Initially, Hegel subsumes philosophical and non-philosophical science under a common heading, a common epistemic genus. He calls it reflective thinking, or this is reflektierendes oder nachdenken, as distinct from merely representational thinking or representation, Vorstellung. Purely representational thinking roughly denotes the epistemic stage at which we can already identify, re-identify, classify, and describe objects whereby the various objects as well as the various properties of an object remain unconnected to one another due to the merely external, spatial and temporal ordering of experiences. Now, how does reflective thinking in general proceed from this stage? One thing I think is already indicated by the expressions nachdenken and reflection. Nachdenken is a thinking that obviously returns to what is already represented, that is, what is known in the form of representation. The aim of this rethinking is to find out what the unity of the object that is already indicated in its general name by representation consists in. We might say representational thinking already claims that the object remains one in the multiplicity of its determinations and appearances, but cannot clarify how this is the case. To clarify this is a desideratum that presents itself in the form of representational thinking and is redeemed in the form of reflective thinking. 
Reflection, we can say, goes beyond stating determinations to explaining them. From, goes from that to why to necessity. Short, in short. In the same context, Hegel emphasizes that philosophy, just like the non-philosophical empirical sciences of the modern age, is concerned with wirklichkeit, with what is, in contrast to what only should be according to the wishful thinking on the part of one philosopher or another. Hegel's unequivocal emphasis on the essential role of experience for scientific reasoning lies along the same lines. Now, having sketched the features common to non-philosophical sciences and philosophy in broad outlines, it is time to explore that difference. According to Hegel's introduction, modern empirical science seems to be limited in two respects respects. It is limited first in content and it is limited secondly with regard to form, to epistemic form. And this twofold limitation cannot be overcome by using the hitherto employed methods and categories but demands new ways of conceptualization and reasoning. As to content, there is a domain of objects that are not captured by a merely reflective science about objects, namely, quote, freedom, spirit, and God. As to form, science in that stage does not match the demands of necessity already implicit in its concepts and judgments. Let us pursue Hegel's diagnosis of deficiency in that respect, the respect of form first. And here, comes a long, long quote from uh, paragraph nine. You find it on the handout, please. Paragraph nine. Subjective reason wants further satisfaction with regard to form. The form is necessity in general. In the kind of science mentioned above, the universal, the genus, etc., contained in it is not determined on its own account nor is it intrinsically connected with what is particular, but universal and particular are mutually external and contingent, just as much as the particularities that are combined are on their own account, external to each other and contingent. Moreover, the beginnings are immediate, found or presupposed. In both respects, the form of necessity fails to get its due. Insofar as it aims at satisfying this need, reflective thinking, this is my proposal for where the Hecker translation has meditative thinking. I use reflective thinking is the thinking that is philosophical in the proper sense, that is speculative thinking. Hence, as a reflective thinking, which in all its community with what first empirically scientific reflective thinking, is at the same time diverse from it, philosophical thinking has its own peculiar forms, apart from the forms that they have in common. The universal form of it is the concept, with capital C. End of quote. That is to say, the formal shortcoming of a science in the stage of mere reflection partly concerns the inner organization of the content and partly uh, the beginning by unmediated starting points. Now, wherein does the lack in respect of inner organization consist? Roughly speaking, the deficit is due to the specific character of conceiving through or in the categories that belong to the realm of the logic of essence. Reflective thinking in this first form the form of understanding, we might also say, surpasses representational thinking in already connecting contents hitherto grasping sheer isolation from each other. But its progress beyond this mere representation notwithstanding, reflective thinking alone keeps up a certain externality 
between the items thus connected. While there surely are forms of necessity in play, these necessities themselves retain a flair of arbitrariness or accidentality. Let us take the most advanced form of explanation within the logic of essence as our example. That is the relation of causality. Let us assume the following sheer nominal definition of causality. A phenomenon of type A is to a phenomenon of type B as the cause is to its effect. If and only if phenomena of type A make it necessary for the phenomena of type B to come into being. This is a clear case of necessary connection, but it is combined with sheer diversity between the types involved, given that those types remain defined in phenomenal descriptions. Types of such a kind present themselves as qualita qualitatively, qualitatively different and indifferent to one another, according to how they have been grasped in even repeated sense perception. Therefore, it remains wholly unclear wherein the types involved in causal explanation give rise to those causal connections fixed in causal laws or causal explanations. This shortcoming in terms of necessity has its complement in the abstract universality of the concept involved, as paragraph nine has pointed out at the outset. A taxonomy corresponding to the description of paragraph nine proceeds from genus to species just by adding different features not yet contained in the nominal definition of the genus. The genus then differs from its species merely in being relatively indefinite. The species concepts in turn repeat the content of their genus concept and differ otherwise accidentally from one another. In such a way of conceptualization and classification, identity and difference between coordinate types remain unconnected, though any ex exemplar of those types is thought of as being substantially one. So on this basis, I think we can also understand how and why the beginnings of empirical sciences in the status of, uh, in the state of merely reflective are, quote, immediate, found or presupposed in a, you know, a problematic way. At its beginning, reflective thinking proceeds through first versions of concepts, prototypes of concepts, versions that are already oriented towards grasping the nature or essence of its objects, but leave it to chance if and how far the selected features represent that nature or essence. Therefore, the pre-scientific consensus or the accidentally dominating general idea determines the content of definitions in the first stage of reflective thinking. Now, having elaborated the formal limits of empirical science so far, I think we are able to see how the step to the concept with a capital C in Hegel's sense may solve the problems at this stage of empirical research. If I understand Hegel well enough, this step is identical with what Hegel calls the progress from merely reflective to speculative thinking in paragraph nine of the introduction. The progress surely will have to meet the nature of the shortcoming it is meant to overcome. Now, the shortcoming consists in a lack of necessity, in spite of the fact that versions of necessary connections between empirical items had already come into play. In that case, the sort of concepts of the entities involved as cause and effect, respectively, showed no sign of how and why it is that both seem to be necessary, necessarily connected. 
And according to these lines, the epistemic progress that is require, required must consist in exploring the nature of both types of entities and nature such that it can explain the aforesaid causal connections. In other words, the progress will consist in a qualified return to the question of what things of the relevant types are in themselves. A question preliminary answered by our pre-scientific representations and now renewed in the light of discoveries about relations, co-variations, actions and reactions of the objects of the kinds involved. Okay, let us now turn to Hegel's diagnosis of a limit concerning the content of um, empirical sciences in the sense of the state of merely reflective science. This is uh, cashed out in paragraph eight of the introduction. Quote, this cognition, that is the cognition reached in merely reflective empirical science, end of brackets, this cognition may be satisfactory enough within its own field. But first of all, a new circle of objects shows up that are not part of this field, freedom, spirit, God. The reason that these are not to be found upon that soil is not because they ought not to belong to experience. It is true that they are not experienced by the senses, but everything that is in consciousness at all is experienced. This is even a tautological proposition. The reason is that these objects present themselves directly as infinite with regard to their content." End of quote. Obviously, Hegel separates himself from the more familiar view of the difficulty that is supposed to stand in the way of the scientific knowledge of these three musketeers. It is not that they are beyond experience altogether, but due to their infinity, that they cannot be grasped by a science of the form sketched above. As far as I can see, there are two ways of interpreting this statement of Hegel. One lies directly in the direction we started with by explaining the formal deficiencies of merely reflective science. In the light of the foregoing account of the formal limits, we may read his explanation as follows. Freedom, spirit, and God share one substantial feature. They are all clear-cut examples of self-determination. And self-determination cannot be grasped in the forms of mere reflective thinking or within the categories of essence. And why is that? As we have seen above, connections of this kind take their objects in an ambiguous way, that is, as essentially determined by other objects on the one hand, and as independent, but then pure qualitative being on the other hand. Thinking in these forms cannot but misrepresent forms of determination where an object turns out to be a subject, where an object determines itself in relating to others. So, this was the first way of interpreting this being infinite. But um, there seems to be also a second interpretation of how Hegel wants to, uh, how Hegel understands this infinity of freedom, spirit, and God. And the second line will bring us to the second strand of motivating the project of philosophy. The second line is present in the remark to paragraph eight, quote, there is an old saying, nihil est in intellectu quod non furit in sensu. If speculative philosophy refused to admit this principle, that would be considered a misunderstanding. But conversely, philosophy will equally affirm, nihil est in sensu quod non furit in intellectu. 
in the most general sense that the noose and more profoundly the spirit is the cause of the world. End of quote. Here, infinity is no longer attested to the spirit only in the sense that it denotes a particular constitution of particular kinds of entities, but explicitly in the sense that the spirit is at the same time the universal, the concept of all spheres of being, including nature. This thesis brings us to the second motivation of philosophy in Hegel's introduction. I sure look, oh, yes, <clears throat> I think um, the, the next two parts are um, shorter, I promise. Part two, absolute spirit are the second motivation of philosophical reflection. The way followed in part one, obviously does not suffice to explain the profile of philosophy as a science of its own. For this track does not lead to a distinctive science called philosophy, but more to an imminent epistemic progress within the sciences with their respective special objects of investigation. Progress in knowledge in many areas is not the same as the spin-off of an independent science, which is meant to treat the same subject areas under a new point of view. In fact, as we just saw uh, in the note to paragraph eight, or the remark to paragraph eight, the introduction to the encyclopedia provides clear indications of such a second motivation for the enterprise of philosophy. A first strong, strong indication of the second motivation is presented as early as the first paragraph. Philosophy is there said to share its object with religion, this object being truth in an absolute sense. However, this hint to religion itself stands in need of explanation, since the same paragraph tells us that philosophy cannot receive this object from religion. In this respect, religion obviously does not relate to philosophy like everyday representational thought relates to empirical science. So for a more direct designation of the need for philosophy, we may address uh, such designations which are already formulated in philosophical language. Such a marking is given by paragraph six, for example, after Hegel has emphasized that philosophy is concerned with nothing but Wirklichkeit, which is also the content of experience and experiential sciences, Hegel states, it is the final purpose of science through the realization of the correspondence between philosophy and experience, quote, to bring about the reconciliation of self-conscious reason with the reason that is, with reality, end of quote. Philosophy and reality thus relate to each other like the self-consciousness and the being or the existence of one and the same being, namely reason. And this is, I think, just in the same line we uh, just uh, heard about in the remark to paragraph eight. This, the news and more profoundly the spirit is the cause of the world. However, for this idea of reconciliation between self-conscious and the reason that is, the two sides must of course first be separated from one another. This is confirmed by the text of the introduction, namely in paragraphs 11 and 12. At the starting point, there is, according to Hegel, now a reflection of thinking in itself, turning away from its concern with things other than itself. Hegel understands this reflection of thinking in itself as the immediate satisfaction of a universal need of spirit, a need that is to, supposed to follow directly from the nature of spirit. This is um, described in paragraph 11, you find it on the handout. Quote, 
The need for philosophy can be determined more precisely in the following manner. As feeling and intuition, the spirit has what is sensible for its object. As fantasy, it has images, and as will, purposes, etc. But the spirit needs also in antithesis to, or merely in distinction from these forms of its thereness, its Dasein, and of its objects, to give satisfaction to its highest inwardness to thinking, and to make thinking into its object. In this way, spirit comes to itself in the deepest sense of the word, for its principle, its unadulterated selfhood is thinking." End of quote. This need and its satisfaction in thinking are not identical with thinking reflecting, reflecting on contents known from experience and given in the form of representation along the lines of development from representation through merely reflective thinking to speculative thinking we um, get to know in the first part of this talk. In contrast to this line, the reflection of thinking in itself which we, with which we are now concerned consists at the same time in the radical turning away from, from the contents and objects of experience. experience. Thus we read in paragraph 12, quote, the coming into being of philosophy out of the need that has been mentioned has experienced the immediate and argumentative consciousness as its starting point. With these needs as its stimulus, thinking conducts itself essentially so as to raise itself above the natural, sensible, and argumentative consciousness into its own unadulterated element. And it gives itself initially a self-distancing negative relationship to this beginning. Thus, thinking finds its first satisfaction in itself, in the idea of the universal essence of these appearances. This idea, in brackets, the absolute, God, can be either more or less abstract." End of quote. It is here where the affinity to religion is obvious, it becomes manifest. But interestingly enough, at the same time, this turning away of thinking from experience is not to be understood simply as a, might say, change of subject. It is obviously not meant as a matter of thinking, dealing with itself for the sake of having a break, a sake of change. Rather, the products of abstraction from experience here involves a kind of downgrading of the experience and the experienced objects, including the thinking subject insofar as it is an object of his own experience, a downgrading to being mere appearance. The subject who thinks in this way, thinks it has found in this products of abstraction from everything, at the same time, the essence of everything, the absolute truth, as we can also say in memory of the first paragraph. Now, as much as Hegel appreciates this turn of thinking, return to itself, he also is very clear in stating that it cannot end at this level reached. The problem lies again in the abstract universality of such world formulas. They are applicable to everything and therefore do not determine anything in its peculiarity. This is, according to Hegel's presentation, not only the inner dialectic of this thinking, but also brings empirical sciences into play again, this time as a counterpart of and a positive stimulus for the hitherto purely speculative thinking, as we learn in the next passage of paragraph 12. Quote, conversely, the experiential sciences carry with them the stimulus to vanquish the form in which the wealth of their content is offered only as something that is merely immediate and simply found as a manifold of 
juxtaposition and hence as something altogether contingent. They are stimulated to elevate this content to necessity. This stimulus pulls thinking out of its abstract universality and out of the satisfaction that is only warranted implicitly. And it drives thinking on to develop itself by its own means. On the one hand, this development is just a taking up of the content and of the determinations that is displaced. But on the other hand, it also gives these determinations the shape of coming forth freely in the sense of original thinking in accordance with the necessity of the matter itself alone." End of quote. At the end of this passage, the task of philosophy is, I think, is fully outlined for Hegel. Philosophy is designed to bring together both movements of thinking, that of pure speculative thinking on the one hand, and that of empirical sciences in the stage of merely reflective thinking, on the other hand, by systematically developing the hitherto merely abstract formulas of harmony, of subjectivity and objectivity, which already has pointed beyond their own abstractness into developing them into the determining reasons of the concepts and conceptual main distinctions of the object domains the empirical sciences are concerned with from their side. Thus realizing the goal which is already imminent to both movements of thinking, that is truth without restriction, absolute truth. To sum up the second way of motivating philosophy and its task, what is According to this line, the goal of knowledge that defines the special task of philosophy, to sum up, it is to prove that the whole world is, as it were, kind of embodied or concretized reason, that reason constitutes its essence, or rather, its concept. Accordingly, then, self-conscious reason and, in the end, philosophy, as its most insightful version is to be proved as not the first, but at the end, the adequate concretization of this concept. This has profound consequences for our concept of logic, of nature and of the human mind. Seen from this angle, logic acquires a meaning and so to say pole position within the sciences that goes far beyond the status of a prop, uh, proper discipline and also far beyond the status of a specific science of its own. The science of logic develops then nothing less than the common concept of nature and spirit. The impact on our concept of nature and of human knowledge is no less dramatic. Human knowledge then is redesigned as discovering step by step its own being in all objectivity or that objectivity including nature is some kind of made for the efforts of cognition and one might say recognizability or knowability is restated as the universal concept of what there is to be recognized or known okay i come now to Part three, the conclusion. Yes, and it's even shorter than the second part. Of course, the overview uh, given so far is by no means an exhaustive description of Hegel's concept of philosophy, but it may uh, suffice for a first critical assessment. Now, does this program of mediation work out? Can it work out? Um, according to my view, it does not and it cannot. And this is because we're not just dealing with two different levels of universality and particularity, not simply with the various non-philosophical empirical sciences working out in more detail what philosophical science unfolded into a system has mapped out on growth. Rather, it is a matter of rather competing alternative conceptions of what the task 
and what the problems of thinking cognition consist in. This I uh, want to show very briefly in two directions, namely, firstly, with respect to the question of the relation of thinking knowledge to its presuppositions, and secondly, with respect to the question of what it means to know absolute truth. Thus, I struggle my way back to the first paragraph, you know, to the first point. The second line of motivating and defining philosophy, which, which begins with the pure reflection of thinking in itself, is characterized, as we have seen, by a polemical stance to experience. This turn of thinking implies that it is somewhat alien to thinking to deal with things other than itself. This thinking, thinking considered it a problem that it is involved in things given. This, on the other hand, seems to be not a problem at all for the first line of motivating and defining philosophical thinking. According to the first line, reflective thinking has to do and to grapple with how objects are given, with the fact that they show contradictions in the way they are represented, problems which demand resolution and explanation. As we also have seen, or may have seen in part one, according to the first line, reflective thinking takes objects from experience without taking the presupposed conceptions as inalterable premises for its own proceeding. It um, is constructively, but also critically reworking the concepts. Now to the second point, to absolute truth. According to the first line of motiv motivating philosophy, the progress from the merely reflective to the speculative or philosophical thinking takes place precisely because of the essence style forms of explanation are recognized as being deficient in that they seek the nature of an object in its relations to others, in the way of reducing, of tracing back to other entities. The consequence or the progress, the inner progress to the concept in Hegel's sense of the term consists accordingly in reasoning to the universal concept proper to the object under investigation. According to the second line, however, the truth of an object redefines itself, I think, differently, in a different manner. With the abstract reflection of thinking in itself, an alternative point of view is brought into play, which competes with, a, with the imminent concept of the particular object. What philosophy adds to the pre-philosophical cognition, scientific cognition of an object, according to the second line, is that philosophy relates the concept of the particular object back to the a priori developed definition of what the essence of everything consists in. Seen in the light of the justification of the transition from the logic of essence to the logic of the concept, this, as far as I can see, is a relapse into the forms of determinations in the style of the logic of essence. Therefore, therefore I come to the conclusion that as plausible as it seems at the outside to undertake a mediating um, enterprise, mediating religion and science, mediating this purely reflection of thinking in itself with um, uh, object-oriented science, as plausible as this seems at the outset, it seems also to bring with it an irresolvable tension into the program of philosophy. Thank you very much. This was the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that friendship. That was really great. Um, so now we're going to go into the uh, Q&A and uh, please 
And if you go to the uh, bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little icon that says reactions. And you can there click to raise your hands. If you want to click on that, if you want to ask a question, and uh, we will proceed in an orderly manner. Yeah, yes, Stephen. Okay, I've just pressed every button on the screen. So did I actually raise a hand? You did, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Friederike, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, I have um, uh, two questions for you. One is a, a very small one about the uh, something you said about the logic of essence, and then another is a slightly bigger one. Um, you said... I think if I understood you right, that um, the notion of self-determination is not grasped in essence. And of course, in one sense, I, I agree. Um, but I noticed that in a way you underdetermined what is involved in causality. So you said that causality involves this necessary connection between elements that are external. But there's one idea that you didn't mention, um, and that is the, this is paragraph 153 of the encyclopedia, where Hegel says that um, the cause is the ursprüngliche Sache. So it's this idea of Ursprünglichkeit. And it seems to me that, okay, that where that's not yet complete self-determination, but it's more than just external necessity and this is why for hegel um causality isn't just being caused by something else causality has this element of ursprünglichkeit so i wanted you to talk about that um, then the second question which addresses your broader uh, issue is is this um it seems to be the way you've described the two different um conceptions of philosophy obviously in one sense makes them incompatible um but i wonder if one needs to describe them like that um because it's interesting that both paragraph nine and paragraph um 12 seem to end up in the same position um and this is that uh, philosophy is the free unfolding of its own necessity. In that sense, it fits your second model. It's purely self-determining. So then what do we do with Hegel's remarks about science? Well, one way of thinking about it is that he's distinguishing what you might call a historical genesis of philosophy and the actual system of philosophy itself. Now, the system of philosophy uh, is as I understand it, that this, your second option is pure self-determining thought that also tells us about, well, you didn't say this, but I think it also tells us about being. But the question is, how does one get there? And in paragraph 12, he says that, and you quoted this, that the empirical sciences provide the rights, the stimulus to that. So there's something going on in the sciences that has to be presupposed for us to have an imminent presuppositionalist science. And that's found in the sciences. But that's got to do, if you like, with the genesis of how we get to do philosophy, either historically or in our own experiences. Um, and one last bit of evidence in this, I know you weren't referring to this, so I'm sorry about that, but, but in paragraph 246, so in the philosophy of nature part um, uh, of the encyclopedia, Hegel tells very much the same story that, you know, you begin with physics, but then what philosophy has to do is give a, um, is, ha is to uh, uh, prove the Greifen or grasp rather the universals of science 
um, in their eigene immanente Notwendigkeit. So again, that suggests a twofold process. If you like, science being part of the process of the genesis of philosophy, how we get to do philosophy, but which will be your first option, I think, but the systematic structure of philosophy itself <clears throat> being defined by your second option. And Hegel, I think, never wavers on that. Philosophy in its structure is always self-determining reason. It's always pure. It just needs experiential, uh, it needs experience, it needs science, in order for us to get to the point at which we can then give a pure derivation of some of the thoughts of science. Okay, sorry, that was rather long, but I wonder if you could respond. I mean, if you don't have time for both, then the second one rather than the first. Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, yeah, really um, good uh, remarks and questions. Um, to the first, um, I can be very short. I fully agree with you. Um, uh, this was um, what um, in, in order to uh, to show the shortcomings of a special conception of causality. I made an um, a stenogram, a, a, an what um, is an abbreviation, um, and it's not the uh, full conception of um, causality. Yes, I just I agree to that. Yes. Um, to the second, um, Trent, um, perhaps I'm I'm I, I, I I'm not quite sure if I um, got you right. Um, if I understand, if I fully understand, um, uh, was it that you um, rem that you um, remind that um, for Hegel, for the concept of philosophy um, to to get started, empirical science is taken in. Um, as a uh, presupposition. Is that your point that um, he Yes, but that, that's part of the, of the uh, mm -hmm. Entstehungsprozess, yeah. if you mm -hmm. like. That's part of the process of a... Mm -hmm. But the actual structure of philosophy itself mm -hmm. is what you describe in your second option, pure self-determination. And so it's a it's a distinct enterprise it's 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 different from science and it's not reflection on science it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a different enterprise mm -hmm. but it it presupposes as part of its entstehungsprozess experience science you get a very good example of this in in hegel's treatment of kepler's laws and galileo's laws in the philosophy of nature Hegel's quite clear about that. The science had to discover those laws first in time, as a matter of fact. But then what philosophy is able to do, he claims, is prove those laws a priori. The proof is purely a priori, but he couldn't have provided that a priori proof, if you like, if they hadn't been discovered a posteriori. And, and I think that's, that's how I would ask, is that a way of explaining your two options. Yes, now, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think I, I, I fully agree with, um, according to the second line, um, yes, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's very clear in uh, paragraph 12 um, and later on in, in the system um, that the, the I, a priori proofs um, they make use of, uh, they turn back, they, they use um, the results of empirical sciences without um, presupposing them as um, um, premises uh, in a kind of syllogistic uh, reasoning or so. Yes, I, I think I, I fully agree to that. Um, but nevertheless, um, what I try to show um, in my first part, I think there is a second 
line of uh, continuation between merely reflective thinking and reflective thinking in speculative form um, that it is not that is not just um, that empirical science uh, works as a stimulus as a, um, as a historical uh, element in the proceeding in the genesis of philosophical philosophical reasoning but uh, that there's a kind of um, there's a sense of uh, doing philosophy that is just the qualitative progress of um, the, of the um, sciences. It's, it's just um, a critical but a continuation of uh, just uh, where um, empirical sciences in the state of um, being a mere reflective science um, has broad knowledge. And um, this is where I think that um, I think I have um, uh, discovered, or well, discovered, I've, I see really that there are two um, conceptions of uh, philosophy or of the task of philosophy itself. Not sure if I got that clear enough, um, but yes, in, in, in the, according to the first line, it's more a kind of, uh, it's an affair of stages of um, scientific reasoning. And according to the second line, it's a kind of um, bringing in um, um, a whole new point of view. And um, this is where uh, both directions um, go or differ. Okay, I don't know if this is, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you. We'll agree to differ. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Dina. Hi, hello. Uh, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, cheers. Uh, hi, Ricky. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, now, I just, I just wanted to ask you uh, for uh, a bit of an elaboration on something, if, uh, if you will. Um, and that's uh, between uh, the account you provide of the um, formal and contentful limitations of a uh, empirical science, non-philosophical non empirical science, uh, the, uh, for the connection between that and the first stellung of thought towards objectivity, uh, specifically Hegel's kind of limitations of uh, fruere or the formalige metaphysique. Uh, because what it seems to me is that a lot of these limitations, which seem to be uh, posited as the limitations of empirical science, uh, also apply to the limitations of the first Stellung, so of, of the former metaphysics. Uh, for example, this idea that, that it focuses on kind of genus, genus species differentiation, that it's stuck in abstract universality of concepts, that is fixed on the categories of essence. Uh, now, if you presented this as, as kind of applying to, to you know, empirical science, but it seems to me that, that Hegel says the same thing about formal metaphysics. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, whether you see uh, connections between them or, or kind of what would the relation between them uh, be. Now, you say at one point that philosophy of the understanding already surpasses this kind of mere representational thinking, uh, which maybe empirical science is stuck at, uh, and, you know, that it kind of thinks God, freedom, and spirit. But at the same time, I think he also says that, that you know, the formal metaphysics thinks about God and freedom as finite concepts rather than infinite concepts. So there seems to be, once again, this, this kind of uh, crossover of limitations between kind of pre-critical metaphysics and um, uh, pre-philosophical science or non-philosophical science. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, on uh, that possible connection. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dino, for this. Uh... Yes, um, and I think um, I'm, I'm, I fully agree with you, with your um, remark that um, the formal shortcomings um, we might see in merely reflective empirical sciences also characterizes um, pre-critical metaphysics. 
yeah, it's, um, for sure, then this is the case. Um, uh, the, um, the difference may, might be, but you already mentioned that uh, too, um, that um, pre-critical metaphysics um, has objects that are infinite, infinite in, con in their content, but um, treat them or treats them um, in this um, finite, merely reflective way in um, taking the subjects for granted, um, even uh, there might be a peculiarity um, within um, an, a special fault of <laughs> pre-critical metaphysics in um, that metaphysics um, doesn't seem to um, reflect critically on um, presupposed representations. Uh, um, it, it defines its, um, its task simply in um, holding presupposed predicates to presupposed conceptions uh, of God and the world and, uh, and the soul. And it um, tries to figure out um, which one of two uh, opposite predicates fits to to what? To the presupposed conception of uh, God or the world or, yes, you know, so. Um, and um, this is a case where um, perhaps um, science, um, non-metaphysical um, science um, advances uh, because it, uh, it isn't satisfied uh, with uh, taking, um, you know, uh, prototypes of definitions with, uh, with um, taking um, nominal, purely nominal definitions as the last word in uh, definitions. They have uh, the, in, the imminent progress to real definitions or the striving for that. And um, whereas metaf metaphysics in its pre-critical um, stage, but this also, if, uh, I think, uh, is for Hegel, is a stage of research. It's, it's not the end of the story, but um, frozen um, in, in this state, um, yes, metaphysics are um, uh, full of presuppositions, immediacies um, that it should better um, had um, viewed at critically. Yes. So, but it, I agree. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, if I if I may, but but that means that I mean because I think you say at one point that uh, that uh, empirical science is also kind of limited to the representations it receives, but then from your answer it seems that it within itself is able to overcome them due to its own process, while while kind of metaphysics seems to be stuck in the received representations. If I understood you correctly. This, this would be a longer uh, story to tell because um, I think hmm, I can only briefly um, give, a, give a hint. Um, I think um, as long as um, those um, who have representations of um, God or the world or the soul as, um, as objects, uh, standing over and against uh, the finite world, uh, so <laughs> the world of um, experience, then uh, we won't be able to overcome the representational form. But we um, we design it, we think of it as a, uh, we conceive of it as a kind of uh, object um, juxtaposed to uh, what is, and there's, there's the inner um, problem uh, of, not of, um, for Hegel, spoken with Hegel, not of metaphysics in general, but for uh, this kind of uh, Wolfian pre-Kantian metaphysics. Okay, this, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. 
Hello, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. And also, I very much enjoyed the, the paper you contributed, as, as you know, the chapter to the collection, where you championed kind of a similar argument. Um, and that already uh, got me going, so maybe I'm, um, I'm a bit re repeating regarding the comments I made. Uh, that I was wondering, what would you say about the category of appearance as a suitable candidate to combine the perspectives? So that if Hegel talks about philosophy as something that finite conscious thinkers do, uh, and when he says when they replace representations with concepts, uh, then they're doing philosophy, um, that this is exactly the same um, activity he describes in the chapter of um, absolute spirit um, as philosophy, as the idea, as Geist, that, that knows itself and nature and Geist. Um, so, so they are the same, only that when he talks about philosophy in terms of finite conscious beings and um, engaging with the findings of science and so forth, that this is how um, absolute Geist um, appears, so to speak. Um, so, uh, he, he, of course, um, the, this difference between the appearance and Geist's uh, self-comprehension is necessary given his kind of post-Kantian commitments to consciousness and its irreducibility uh, in a way. But he still speculatively maybe thinks that they are the same thing in terms of um, a finite conscious philosophy being the um, irreducible appearance of uh, universal um, uh, absolute spirit. Yeah, I was wondering yeah, whether you think this might be uh, a strategy to, to unite those two um, seemingly contradictory uh, ways of thinking about philosophy. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. And, and hi, um, I, I just wonder, perhaps I'm, I'm just a little bit <laughs> through, a um, little bit, yeah, um, in, in, in which respect, perhaps you could um, um, make this, um, um, describe this a little bit further, in, in which way do you think um, that the category of appearance uh, might help? Um, I, I would put <laughs> the category of appearance within the logic style, uh, uh, the logic of essence style. And uh, th this is just where, where I think that the problem is, the heart, the core of the problem is um, to, um, it, it's the difference between, um, I think it's a whole world of difference of um, um, finding out what, I don't know, a finite thinker is, um, what, um, some kind of phenomenon uh, in nature is what uh, the civil state is. Um, this is one project. And um, uh, to maintain the thesis that um, whatever it is, it is the appearance of an essence um, that has to be distinguished from it. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. this is for for okay. me, this is uh, the problem, not the solution. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but yeah. perhaps I, I I didn't get it. I yeah. I think I didn't get your point. Yes. Yeah. I think I think it's it's, it's misleading the way I phrased it. So, uh, for example, the phenomenology of spirit, but also in the systems phenomenology, when Hegel says that consciousness is how Geist appears. So uh, I think he refers to a kind of inward appearance. So like um the inward shining of the concept, or um so the let's say the the finite thinkers as particulars are how the universal of Geist posits itself uh, internally. So if you want to apply the logic of essence to the relationship between a finite consciousness and Geist, uh, then you would have to say um, us as philosophical thinkers, as appearance of Geist are the result of Geist's internal positing, how Geist conceptually posits itself uh, internally, the, the, like in the logic of the concept where um, all determinations are the result of an internal shining or internal positing of, of the concept. So, so are we as, as, as finite thinkers. Um, that's why I think Hegel says the truth has to appear. So even from the perspective of the logic of the concept, if you apply that logic to Geist, um, then uh, Geist has to appear, i.e. Geist has to take the form of finite particular philosophers in order to be absolute Geist, uh, so to speak. But yeah, but yeah, uh, he's not I would say he has to, as you said, he has to argue that the logical structure that informs the appearance, that's behind the appearance, is not some kind of a logic of essence 
um, distant ground that cannot be really known because we, we, we um, logically begin with the appearance. But actually, um, he, I would say he, he begins with the um, uh, concept of Geist and then shows a finite uh, Geistige beings as us, as philosophers, as uh, the, the inward appearance of, of Geist, as a universal conceptual uh, uh, principle. So um, it is appearance, but it is appearance in the context of the logic of the concept. So it's, it's yeah, um, yeah, I'm just repeating myself. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I, um, um, just perhaps one um, sh very short remark. Um, I think this is um, wholly in um, in the line of Hegel. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, and, um, I, and this might be one of the reasons that he takes up at the end um, of the system um, that the long uh, discussion of uh, pantheism, you know, and I think there's just um, this just this point that he makes that um, identity and diversity and relationship um, people uh, haven't people read my logic <laughs> the science of logic is in that is like uh, identity is not identity there are many forms of it and um, only the most advanced of them only the form of concept and, and idea um, are proper to grasp uh, what is at stake in um, uh, spirit and um, the relationship between absolute spirit and finite spirits so that that's, I think you're full in the line of Hegel's, uh, of Hegel. I, um, uh, I, I, I have, um, Sachman, Kronz, I have, um, my doubts, um, um, re remain, um, because, um, I, perhaps uh, only at the moment, but I, I cannot see how do you, um, um, spell this relationship between universal spirit and spirit as one particular kind of entities uh, um, yes uh, that are um, living in the world they are living in the world um, they do not constitute the world they live in the world and um, there's there uh, there's nature um, really over and above them <laughs> outside them and um, if i say um, nature is um, intrinsically um, yes you know teleologically um, to, to be designed as a kind of um, um, external um, outing of the idea um, a step stone in order to um, for the glorious returning of <laughs> universal spirit um, back to its adequate uh, you know um, this is, I think, where inevitably um, you uh, replace um, um, special, the special university, uh, uni university, universality uh, of um, what nature is by uh, it relating it to something other. And um, this is where my, um, yeah, my, my doubts, um, or, or where, where I have doubts uh, whether this um, transforming into uh, forms of concrete universality mm -hmm. uh, might, yeah, succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Please. Thanks. Thanks very much for the talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is just, I just want to just uh, check that I've understood what the contradiction is that you're pointing at. And then if I have, um, try very, very quickly just to sort of make a suggestion as to why it, maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't a contradiction, right? Um, so the, 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 the concern is that there are two um, tasks for philosophy or two characterizations of, 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 what, of, of what's involved in philosophy. One of them is that um, uh, philosophy is sort of directed at um, directed at extra philosophical sciences at the results of those sciences because it, it's sort of you need to sort of 
speculatively supplement their results in order to make them fully satisfactory. So in one sense, it's directed at something experiential and empirical. And on the other hand, um, it looks as though Hegel is also characterizing philosophy as directed oh, away from the empirical and away from the experiential because it's reflexive and, and it has to do with this self-thinking, self-knowing thought, right? So, that, so that's, that's the contradiction, right? That philosophy is pulling into, there's two characterizations of philosophy that are pulling in two different directions. One towards the empirical experiential stuff and one away from it. Is that, is that fair, roughly? Um, that uh, might be, um, that, is a, mm, that will, uh, would be a little bit, um, I should say, under complicated, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, um, I because uh, according to the second line, um, the real task, the full task uh, of philosophy is to, um, to, re, um, God, to reconciliate, yes, is that right? Yes. To reconcile, um, yes, yeah. To, to re, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry. No, no. To, to reconcile um, this um, striving for um, pure self-affirmation, a, a kind of self-affirmation of thinking, and th this um, this is um, doing um, um, to to uh, get rid of um, everything uh, that is not thinking itself. But okay. this is only. Um, this is the one um, extreme pole, and philosophy has the task to um, mediate, to, to reconcile this um, need or this striving for uh, pure self-affirmation um, with uh, knowledge of the objectivity. And I think this, is, um, this would be uh, more fair to Hegel. Uh, Hegel would not say um, philosophy is... Um, <laughs> spinning off in uh, no, no, sure. yeah. Okay, yeah. this is okay. Now. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, then maybe yeah. Then then I would have to say then I would need to say more than I'm than I'm able to now to to fully address it. I think. But um, what I was what I was going to to, to say, and I think I can I think it might still be helpful. I'll say it very quickly. Um, is is just that um, it seems to me that it's important that this material that you're drawing on, the, the, this intro, the introductory material and, and, and the, the preliminaries to the encyclopedia are, are sort of, they're, in, they're introducing the encyclopedia as a whole uh, and, they're in, and, they're, and they're at the beginning of the first part of it. Um, uh, and sometimes I think, I, I was wondering whether some of what, we can take the point Stephen made uh, about distinguishing between uh, the motivation behind a, a kind of a priori science and um, what's involved in in doing that in a scientific way and not taking stuff for granted. F fair enough. Um, but I, I just, I thought that um, maybe when Hegel is talking about um, thought re reflecting on, it, on itself and just distancing itself at the beginning from the empirical experiential stuff. Um, that's, that characterization of a sort of a priori project for, for philosophy looks as though it's best, best suited for characterizing the logic. Whereas when he's talking about philosophical cognition um, uh, and what's involved in taking conceptual material and applying it to the sciences, um, that uh, that um, is sort of perhaps characterizes what you do on the basis of the logic um, when you when you come to consider nature and when you come to consider finite spirit. And so, in in a sense, saying that those two things are, are contradictory would be a little bit like saying that Spinoza's second and third kinds of knowledge are contradictory. On the one hand, you're doing your sort of your sort of general metaphysics, and on the second, you're applying them to knowledge of of particulars. Um, that's, uh, I don't know whether you could push that further to, to really get rid of the contradiction as you've spelled it out, but I thought maybe something in that direction might be helpful. Maybe it isn't. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the hint. I, um, yes, I, I, I will have to rethink it. Um, thank you very much. Um, but. Um, only one short um, 
hint uh, that um, in uh, to to um, to um, yeah to develop a science of logic um, will not collapse into um, thinking speculatively on object domains uh, presented by uh, empirical sciences. And um, this won't even be the case um, if we had not this second strand of um, philosophy. Um, I think it, I uh, would not have to, um, to confuse um, logic, the science of the categories on the one hand, and the applying of categories in um, science. Um, but um, the, um, but it, it seems to me, according to me at the moment, um, it seems to me that there would be still, there remain two conceptions. <laughs> um, according to the first uh, path, I did say nothing about um, uh, where do we, wh what do we do with the science of logic then, according to these lines? And I think, according to these lines, uh, we get a fully cashed out um, science of its own. It's a reflection on uh, what we do in, um, in uh, thinking through objects. Um, it remains um, a science in its own right and um, has, it doesn't have to collapse into um, in, in its own application. And uh, it doesn't have to collapse to, to, to be reduced into a sh merely propedeutic uh, discipline. No, it, re it remains a science. But um, I think there remains still the difference uh, in status um, whether you take the logic of science as a, this is the logic of, um, uh, the science of logic, sorry. If you take it to be um, the science of the categories taken purely <laughs> for their own, or if you take it um, with the, um, um, uh, with a claim, um, with the claim that in doing the science of logic, you are um, cashing out what is the essence of all what there is. I, they, this is, I think, this is where the uh, lines still may part. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. And thank you once again, uh, Professor Schick, for your wonderful paper. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. And we will see you next week for the final session of the conference. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Schick, and uh, have a good week, everyone. Thank you very much, all. And I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to meet and to meet again. Thanks. Thanks to all. <laughs>